This is Rhett Reed Podcast. We take a deep dive into the Fear Street series. And review other books we've read. I'm Serge. And I'm Anna. We're happy you can join us. Readers. Welcome to another episode of Rhett Reed Podcast. Well, we're going to start this episode out with a review of a book we both read called American Panda by Gloria Chow. This is like a pretty interesting book. I just finished reading it upon Anna's recommendation. And I actually read it a couple weeks back and had a, had a lot of time to digest her thoughts and feelings about the book. It's a YA book. The story is about a 17-year-old girl named May. She actually graduated high school early to go to MIT. She has the pressure from both her parents where they're pushing her to go to med school. They're pushing her to get married to a nice Taiwanese doctor. And they're pushing her to make sure that she does nothing but study, pass her classes, and go to med school in four years. And there's basically no room there for her, who she is. They've plotted out their version of who she is. And she's got this Pavlovian guilt response. Response anytime she wants to try something that is outside of that vision that they've laid out for her. This book comes at you really hard right off the bat, that stereotypical tiger parent description, and you actually, if you find yourself getting really angry at her parents, I, at least I did. Well, she's also an extreme germophobe. She carries hand sanitizer with her everywhere and needs to hand sanitize herself or any parts of her body where she deems that have become dirty. Right, and her parents know this about her, and instead of recognizing this as something that is maybe like a deal breaker for becoming a doctor they are forcing her to continue down this path they've set out for her despite all the signs pointing out otherwise and she has an older brother who is disowned by her family because he didn't go to MIT he went to Dartmouth first of all so there's already a strike against him but he also ended up being with a girl who may have fertility issues they forbid him to marry her and he decided to go ahead and date her anyway despite that so he got disowned. So the reason I wanted Serge to read this book was because I identified so much with May, the main character. It was really hard for me to sort of separate myself from the work itself because there were so many things that were similar to my childhood. I know people who read this, many of you will go, oh, this book is so cliche with how overbearing the parents are. It's just not possible for people to be like this. And why is she the way she is? And it's just like, you know what? I see my my parents in May's parents the upbringing that we had, the whole filial piety that we were brought up with, the guilt that May has and how cowed she is to her parents and how she's unwilling to seek her own dreams because she's afraid of how she'll affect her parents. That is something that I and many of my friends, that was how we were brought up. Going into this, the way the filial piety is ingrained into her thought process, the entire book is from May's point of view and you go through her thoughts and you can see how difficult it is for her to think outside of these parameters because the way the thought process has worked is that she's been round and round this track for so long. Basically, anything that's outside of the experience, she has to actually jump the tracks that she's ground into this thought process. And it's very uncomfortable for her. And it's very funny. There's several scenes in the book where it explains how when she's talking to a friend, she can be critical of how constrained she feels by her parents and how uncomfortable it makes her that she is expected to do certain things that don't fit what she wants to be as a person. As soon as her friend and whoever it is in that particular occasion, there's a couple occasions where this happens, agrees with her and sides with her against her parents. She actually feels the need, this visceral need to jump to her parents' defense and actually starts arguing with her friend. It's mentioned on a couple of occasions. It's really interesting how she'll like defend her family to the end, even if she was just complaining about them a second ago to this friend and this friend's like trying to defend her and going like, yeah, you're right. She'll instantly switch sides and be like, no, how dare you? That's something that I feel like rings true to me. I'm pretty sure I've seen that happen. 
There is a lot of Taiwanese, Chinese cultural things in this book. There's a lot of, we need to set our child up to get married. I'm seeing this in my life right now to my family members. And there's all the weird Chinese medicine things. If you do 300 arm circle swings, you will have better toned this. Or if you drink this juice, your breasts will be better for, you know, babies or attracting men or whatever. These sounded like weird WeChat Chinese medicine memes getting spread around. Yeah, well, it didn't seem like the mom was using WeChat to get these. It seems like it was just within the Chinese community, but for sure in the WeChat community. I mean, I see it all the time and it's just frustrating because I keep getting these things sent to me like, oh, you need to drink this or you need to eat that and this will help with your fertility and this will help with weight loss and that will make you smarter if you have to eat that. And it's just like, no, thank you. Unlike May, I I am an adult and I don't live with my parents. I don't live near my parents anymore. So it's a little different for me. Whereas for May, her parents make sure they see her every week and there's no escaping from having this stuff thrust on her. This is an interesting point I want to bring up is I like the structure of the book. I like the way it's structured. So every chapter begins with a couple of voice messages from mom. And it's a good way to constantly remind you that her mother is a never-ending presence in May's life. There could have been other ways to do it, which would have been, I think, way more awkward than the way it's just sort of inserted into the story in every chapter break. She's getting these ridiculous voicemails from her mom, which are just way overbearing, way overprotective, super stalker. I liked the scene where May doesn't pick up her phone for like a few hours, I think it is, and her mom calls the police. Yeah, I almost feel like, I don't know for sure, but I feel like that actually happened to somebody we know. That happened to me? (laughs) Okay, that's that's what I was thinking, yeah. (laughs) This is like such an Asian parent thing to do, it's funny. Yeah. And there's another thing that I definitely connected to in this book. There was a scene where her parents do everything for her so that she doesn't have to do her laundry. She doesn't have to cook. She doesn't have to buy anything. She just needs to study. Her job is study. And she was talking about how, like, it's so important to her family to study and not have any distractions that when her grandfather died when her father was in college, no one told him because they wanted him to just focus on studies and not get distracted. And that same thing happened to me and my grandmother. It was during exam times, and then no one told me, and they refused to tell me the entire time for days and days that she had passed away. And it wasn't until I had come back from school that I had to figure it out for myself because they still didn't want to tell me because they thought it would be hard on me. Which it's it, kind of messed up, right? It's, yeah, it's a little messed up. When she's telling this story, she talks about how she lives in constant fear that something's going to happen to her family and they would never tell her. And like, I get that because I kind of have that fear as well that something's going to happen. I won't find out. I did have a question. Yeah, okay. One thing I noticed in the book, so I am fluent in Mandarin. I know my pinging. I can read basic stories. Right. This book has a lot of pinging in it, Curse. phonetically written out Chinese. Okay. And it's just scattered throughout the book. There's a lot of it. Did you, as someone who doesn't know any Mandarin, have any trouble with it? No, but I think I'm a little bit biased here because I do read a lot of books that have foreign languages just inserted everywhere. I've learned to deal with it. You know, reading mythology, it often happens that there's passages that are mostly in a foreign language. Reading a lot of translations, that's also the case. Also being trilingual it probably plays a role, as well as the fact that some of my favorite fantasy books have long passages in made-up languages. And so, whatever. I kind of glossed through it and it was fine. So the words aren't defined anywhere else in the book. Do you think that someone who's not at as adept at dealing with that sort of thing? Do you think they would struggle with that? I don't think so. A lot of it is really contextual. It really isn't a problem. I don't speak a lick of Mandarin and it was fine. I will say that there was one storyline I didn't think really needed to be in the book. I mean, I think it helped her journey in one sense. It really like solidified one of the things that she was thinking the entire time. But I did think that it sort of felt like it wasn't needed. It could have been done another way. And it was done another way. Later on, you're talking about the doctor, right? Yes. The doctor character was completely useless and superfluous. She actually learned those same lessons that she learned through her somewhere else. But I think the one thing it does point out is that she really tried. 
She already knew she was going to hate the job. But also, she went ahead and actually tried to audit a doctor doing her doctorly duties as a freshman in college, thinking about going into the pre-med track. Which is, by the way, amazing. You know, I went into science, and in the science major, you often do undergraduate research. I didn't even think about doing any kind of undergraduate research or shadowing another scientist or anything my freshman year. That was nowhere even near anywhere my perception. And so that shows that she was actually very with it, really focused on her future and thinking about her future. And so she learns from shadowing this doctor that being a doctor is probably not for her, but she actually then tries again a second time. And tries again, you know what, maybe that time I didn't get the right impression, I'm going to try once again, I'm going to try to see, maybe this really is for me, and she tries something else, and then again, she learns the same exact thing, like, oh yeah, it's really not for me. But I feel like it shows that, you know, she's not just casting away her parents' wishes just willy-nilly. She really gave it the old college try, and then some. And then some, and then some. She really, really wanted to please her parents. I think if she had been somebody that was not just completely and utterly from the very core of her soul averse to the practice of medicine, she would have gone through and done everything her parents wanted of her, and she would have been like the perfect quote-unquote daughter that they always wanted. It was just that she was completely the diametric opposite of somebody that could practice that career path, and her parents were so stuck that they weren't willing to see that. And that's the whole point. It's like, she really, really wanted to please her parents. She'd been brought up to, like, really, really deeply, deeply wanted, honestly wanted to please them, and she couldn't. That's the story, right? Is like, what do you do? It's like an unstoppable force and an immovable object sort of scenario. My point was that that kind of illustrated that she tried twice. Yeah, she really did try hard. Though I will say, like, for most of my friends and I who were pre-med, we were shadowing doctors in high school and doing research in high school. Well, yeah, because you guys, uh, you know. I do think that some people are going to read this book and think, this is just too much. This is just not believable. Cliche or not, in your opinion, coming from someone who does have this background, I have a friend who is the perfect daughter. And like, you would look at her and you would be like, this person is perfect. And you know what? Her parents are still on her case about every little thing. That really is reality for like a lot of people. Obviously, every parent wants their kid to succeed. At what cost? I I think there was a story in the book where somebody graduated from medical school, got their MD, and then committed suicide. There were a lot of stories in this book. (laughs) The Chinese community in this book, very gossipy. They might not have even, you know, most of their stories seem to be half-truths. Yeah, I think that the Chinese community grapevine is the real villain of this book. Yeah, actually, that was probably the most toxic thing in this book. So freaking toxic. You just want to punch these people. At first reading this book, I really got angry at the parents. And then like later on, you begin to realize that they're just like a cog in this system. They're just like stuck. You really just want to punch the system. Well, this is the big difference between the community that I grew up in versus the community in this book. The community in this book was very, you know, Abby. She decided to have one drink one night and that was the end of her. And now she's probably living under a bridge or something like that. In our community, it was... Look at Abby. Look at how smart she is. You're never going to be that smart. But you should at least try to be that smart. So it was like very different. It's like the opposite of that. (laughs) Yeah, Abby had one alcohol. Next day, prostitute. Yes, that was what it was like in American (laughs) Pandas. How many pandas would you give this book? I would give this book a solid three and a half pandas. Round up to four. How many pandas would you give this one? I'd give it the same. Three and a half rounds to four. Yeah, so for me, I gotta say the issues were the second half of the book, the pacing rapidly accelerated, and the story kind of simplified down to kind of a boiled down plot for me. That was the negative. I liked all the family drama stuff. I thought that was well done. The Dr. Chang storyline was a little off. I don't know how I felt about the whole Darren storyline. Yeah, so those are our thoughts on American Panda. Thanks for writing a great book, Gloria Chow. Thanks for representing the community. Yeah, that was very enjoyable my first foray into modern YA fiction. So yeah, thank you for that. After the intermission, we're going to be reviewing Fear Street Sunburn.
Her throat ached. Her face was burning. The back of her neck itched, but she couldn't scratch it. Water rode over the sand, making it suddenly heavier on the chest. The waves are getting closer. I'm going to drown. And on that note, folks, let's get right into the prediction accuracy for Fear Street Sunburn. I said that it was going to be another beach vacation in the summer, correct? Ding, ding, ding. I said it'd be a northeast beach, but the main girl's from Shadyside. I assume it's a northeast beach. It had that vibe. Kind of had a little bit that vibe, didn't it? I said that the murderer is a male. Wrong. I said the murder victim is a female. Correct. And I said the murder weapon is suffocation and the body will be left out in the sun. There's no real answer to this, so... Well, the body left out in the sun, we know that's not true. Well, it could have been for a mm. little bit. So I said it would be a Florida vacation, and like, I'm pretty sure, once again, I'm wrong. I even kind of knew this going into this, but you know what? I'm going to carry on making that Florida prediction because one day, one day it may be true. So I also said the girls are rivals working on the perfect 10, and <laughs> I guess that was another throwaway. I got like a little carried away with the whole Florida thing. So I also said that one girl will be jealous of another girl. Guaranteed. I guaranteed it. This one's a little bit kind of like Anna's left out in the sun. This one's been left out in the sun a little bit too long. As far as prediction accuracy is concerned, it might stink a little bit. So it'll have a shady side kid. Ding, ding, ding. A murder weapon drowning. For all we know, that might be true. And the murder female and victim female, I got correct for once. Let's get into the plot synopsis. So it's the first week of August and we're having a Camp Full Moon Bunk 12 reunion. After a year of doing a poor job keeping in touch with each other, What's a better way to catch up with one another than hanging out at a summer house on the beach in Summerhaven? Between being left out in the sun to bake and electrocution, it seems that there are probably significantly better ways of catching up. We can just get into the characters here. Claudia Walker is the main character. She's described as having straight auburn hair, and she spends most of the book sunburned, as you probably heard from that opening passage that Anna read earlier. She's calm and control all the time. She never really shows her true feelings. She lives on Fear Street, and she shares a cramped room with her younger sister, Cass. So she's having a bad summer. She broke up with her boyfriend of two years, Steve, after a fight on the 4th of July. She also lost her summer waitressing job because the restaurant went out of business. So when she received a letter saying, hey, let's all hang out at the summer house, she was like, well, I have nothing better to do. Yep, and also I'm assuming she's really excited to meet all her friends, although it's a little bit debatable. Maybe there was a reason they all didn't write to each other. Joy Birkin. I guess this is what passes for diversity in Arl Stein's books so far, but Joy Birkin is described as being exotic looking. She has slightly slanted green eyes, olive skin, dark full lips, and straight black hair, <gasps> which fell loosely down her back, nearly to her waist. So I'm guessing she's like somewhat Mediterranean. She's terrified of bugs, and she's also very emotional and dramatic. Sophie Moore is the shortest of the four friends. She has frizzy light brown hair that bobs on top of her round face. She wears wire-rimmed glasses to look older, but still somehow looks only 12. And she copies everything that Joy does. And then you have Marla Drexo, the owner of the summer house. She's tall and more slender than the previous year. She's got strawberry blonde hair and blue eyes. And her sister Allison actually died the previous year in camp. Yeah, and it's a little bit of a mystery that we get to kind of unravel as the book goes on. Her father is actually Anthony Draxel. He's a financial wizard. Yep, and he made his money buying up companies around the globe. Mother Drexel is a socialite, and she accompanies her husband everywhere. And she spends most of her time making the rounds at international benefits, so she's not really at home. Their kids are left by themselves, and we already mentioned that... Marla had a younger sister named Allison. Allison Drexel was one year younger than Marla, and as we already mentioned, she died the previous year at camp. And she's described as being long and slender with blonde hair and blue eyes, and is somewhat less sophisticated than her older sister. She doesn't have the grace or natural athletic skills that her sister has. She was also a world-class brat who always wanted to get her sister and friends in trouble. 
We also have Alfred Ryan. He's a jolly, plump, middle-aged man with a pink bald head and a tiny gray mustache perched under a bulbous nose. He's apparently extremely nearsighted, but doesn't wear glasses. And he's a servant for the Drexels. Next up, we have Daniel. He's tall and very good looking, with a dark, handsome face with dark eyes. He has short black hair, muscular arms, and looks like he works out. Carl, slim with dark razor-cut hair and gray eyes. And finally, we have Dean, who's Carl's friend, and he's got longish blonde hair and a more compact build of a wrestler. He's very toothy. He's got this shark's grin. And now, a word from our sponsors. This episode of Rut Read Podcast is brought to you by Shady Side Sunburn Removal. Say goodbye to the aloe. All right, let's get into the end of plot. This book is told from Claudia's point of view, and throughout the whole book, you get flashbacks to the summer camp they all went to the previous year. Every few chapters, you get these flashbacks, which are also from Claudia's viewpoint, and you get this slow, unraveling reveal of what happened that fateful summer regarding Allison's death. We're all wondering, why did she die? How did she die? What happened? You don't get to find out right away. Marla never wants to talk about it, and every once in a while, you get this flashback from Claudia's memory, and a little more gets revealed, until finally we understand the entire truth. Before all this can happen, we actually open the book with Claudia facing imminent death. So she's buried in the sand, and she has no way to move or get out from under the sand, and the tide is coming up, and she's basically going to drown. Yeah, she's been left out there for hours. She's burnt, blistered, and dehydrated. The tide is coming up. There's nothing she can do but scream for help, but there's no one around. Well, until a dark shadow slowly goes over her, and she's thinking it's the shadow of death. But it's actually a guy named Daniel. So he and buries her and helps her up the stairs from the beach to the Drexel Summer Mansion. The Drexel Summer Mansion has a gate between the beach and the property. And somehow Daniel is able to input the code to open the gate to let her in. Claudia is like way too messed up from the sunburn and heat stroke. And she doesn't question it too much. She's like too busy being in pain. And she's also somehow... Finding some space in her totally heat-stroked out mind to be crushing on how good Daniel looks. Yes, one of her first reactions to him is, wow, he's really good looking. Maybe he's just that good looking, but I've gotten heat stroke and sunburn a few times, and you're just more dazed and confused than anything else in that situation. And after she just almost died, I would think she'd be focusing on other things. Well, when she makes it back to the main house, the other girls are really surprised to see her. They thought she was already upstairs. That's why they never went back to the beach to check on her after they went on their walk. But they did bury her, so it's a weird thought process. How do they think she got out of the sand? She kind of glosses over this, though, and she turns around to introduce them to Daniel, and we realize that he's gone. He kind of just disappeared. And nobody else saw him except for her, right? Well, fast forward to dinner. Claudia seems super chill about the fact that her friends left her out to die, and they're having a pretty good meal. Alfred brings out the salad that Marla dishes out for everyone, and they're all, like, enjoying their salad when all of a sudden, a scream. Remember how Joy really hates bugs? Well, there's like a big old worm right in her salad. Yeah, and she is freaking out, and Alfred has to come and take the salad away, and they go back to eating their meal. We promise that's actually significant to the plot. Nobody knows where that worm came from. I guess Marla kind of says, oh, you know, it must be Alfred because he's so nearsighted. But Claudia is actually reminded about the boy who rescued her and is kind of freaked out because the guy knows the gate code, but then he kind of just disappears, even though it's a private beach. And he disappears once they're already inside the compound. So where could he have gone? It doesn't make any sense. Well, she says that it must be the ghost boy, the ghost boy who lives in the guest house. And then she spins this insane yarn about... This is Marla, right? Marla's the one that is uh, making up this story? Yes, about a ghost boy. He was murdered in the guest house, now he just haunts it. The three girls, they end up eating this story right off. Turns out she's just messing with them, and she can't believe they all fell for the story, and I guess it's kind of like a mean trick that she plays on them. I don't know if it's a mean trick. It sounds like it's just pretty funny. None of the girls believe Claudia's story about Dan either. They think that she either hallucinated him or she just has a wild imagination and is making him up. 
Well, she did just have, like, heat stroke and her face is all burnt off, so who knows. Also, she was sleeping right before she supposedly saw him, so there's that. What's interesting is that later in the book, she has a conversation with Alfred, and he says that he vacuums and dusts the guest house every week, and there's definitely no one there. And with the security system and the security dog, an Irish wolfhound, on premise, there is no way that there can be some Randall walking around. Either Alfred's lying or there's a ghost. But I'll give you a hint. This is not Fear Street, the ghost boy. Right. So the next day, while waiting for Joy and Sophie to get up, Marla and Claudia decide they're going to play a game of tennis. They used to play tennis a lot back in camp, and they were pretty evenly matched. But Marla promised Claudia that she would get a private tennis tutor and get better. Claudia fully expects that she's going to get her butt whooped by Marla. Except that doesn't happen. Marla is awful. She can't return any serves. Claudia wins straight sets, and she hasn't even worked up a sweat from winning these straight sets. Claudia tries to make excuses for Marla's bad playing, maybe bringing back memories of her sister Allison's death. But Marla refuses to talk about her sister's death and just ends up storming off. When they all regroup later that day, they decide to go head down to the beach. I mean, they are at a beach house. Marla asks Sophie to open the gate, not knowing that the gate security electrical system is still on. It's supposed to go off automatically during the day. So Sophie goes to open the gate, and immediately she's electrocuted. She's shot backwards, and she ends up slumped on the ground. Sophie's dizzy and in pain, but somehow she still wants to go to the beach. So they set up on the beach, and Sophie's just going to hang out with super sunburnt Claudia under this big umbrella they have. And while they're setting up, Claudia notices that Marla is super, super pale, even though she supposedly was at the beach all summer long. Maybe she's been using burn removal cream. When they're on the beach, they're joined by two boys who were pulled in by an extremely strong riptide. They were surfing down by the town, but the tide kind of drifted them all the way over here. These guys go from being washed up on a distant shore to flirting in about three seconds. Joy is like totally into that, and Marla is totally not into that and wants to just get rid of them. She's sarcastic, she's rude, and she's pretty cold towards them. Everything they say, she'll have a snarky remark. She's constantly saying, so are you leaving yet? This is a private beach, you need to leave. But they kind of throw it right back at her. She'll be like, this is a private beach, and they're like, oh, you own the beach too? Later, they'll be talking, they'll be like, oh, did you know? This is a private beach. And then, like, high-five each other. Like, they are not having any of Marla, and she's not having any of them. Yeah, it's pretty awkward for Claudia, who's just sort of sitting there, trying to, like, stay in the shade and relax after her stressful day yesterday. There's just this big conflict brewing around her. Well, Dean and Carl, who are the guys who get brought up to shore, they, like I said, could care less about Marla. But they end up inviting themselves to lunch and staying. They literally just grab the cooler and go, hey, what's for lunch? They start emptying the cooler. And when the girls go, is there anything for us? They're like, I guess we could share. But it's the girls' cooler in the first place. Well, it turns out there's plenty enough food for everybody, so I guess that's good. Marla does not think this is okay. She storms off to the water while the other girls sort of flirt and chat with the guys. Yeah, and the guys make some snide comments about Marla. Actually, she does come off a little snooty. I mean, I'm not saying the guys are totally right invading this little picnic, but on the other hand, well, you know, I kind of see Marla's point of view, to be honest with you. They're real jerks, actually. (laughs) Once they're done eating, Marla asks them to leave again, and instead of leaving, they're like, no, we want to go upstairs and party in the house. Come on, let's go. They're kind of menacing and demanding, and they refuse to leave, which is not great, but Marla stands her ground. There's this really weird scene where Dean just slaps Marla, and he's like, oh, there was a horsefly. So he claims that he's sorry and you didn't mean to hit her so hard, but it's kind of made clear that there probably wasn't really a fly there. Carl is kind of like, okay, you know what, why don't we just go? This is getting a little weird. Well, Dean's parting words for Marla are, my dad used to work for you. Whatever, good for you. So the girls ask Marla why she was so rude to the guys and why she didn't just invite them up. Well, she says that she promised her parents that it'd be just the four of them. She'd get in trouble otherwise. I mean, that makes sense. Also, you just don't invite strangers into your house. What are the girls thinking? (laughs) They just met these guys and they're already like robbing their picnic basket. It's probably not wise to just invite them up to party. They don't really think much of Marla's behavior because she was really weird with guys the previous year anyway. So this sort of just matches up. But they do discuss it later, Claudia, Joy, and Sophie, and they do think that Marla's a little off this trip. She's more angry and tense, and the trip itself feels kind of weird. Claudia's almost been burnt to a crisp, Sophie's been electrocuted. 
Sophie and Joy actually tell Claudia that they really wanted to go back to check on her, make sure she was okay, but Marla was really insistent that they don't need to, and that Claudia was definitely in the house, and don't worry about it, and they thought that was kind of weird. Maybe they're just trying to make excuses, because honestly, there's two of them and one of Marla, they probably should have gone back to check. But Sophie does whatever Joy does, and if Joy decides, okay, whatever, Marla's right, then Sophie's not going to argue. They say maybe Marla's just a little messed up in the head because of what happened to Allison last summer, but they find it strange that she she never wants to bring it up. But is that strange? No, it's not strange. These girls are like, why didn't she invite these random strangers to the house? That's strange. It's like, it's not that strange. And they're like, why doesn't she bring up her sister's death and always like seem to get angry and huff off when we bring it up? It's like, well, that's not strange either. They start suspecting her for some reason, but like they're suspecting her for all the wrong reasons, I think. They end up going to the boardwalk together and they have fun at all the boardwalk mainstays, you know, the house of mirrors. <laughs> yeah, the Ferris wheel. Bumper car. And then they run into Caro and Dean. They decide to invite them to go bumper carring. You know, Joy and Sophie are like, time to flirt. And Marla is like, I will chaperone so they don't invite the boys over to the house. Claudia doesn't really feel like bumper carring because I guess she's still recovering from her sunburn. She just wants to walk around town on her own. Lo and behold, she bumps into Daniel, the ghost boy. I think she starts poking his face and like pinching him. She like tries to figure out if he's a ghost or not, right? Well, she starts with saying, oh, you're not a ghost. (laughs) And then poking him and he was like, wait, what are you talking about? Right. But then they just have a nice walk on the boardwalk. Claudia tells him about her life and last summer and the summer so far. And he just listens. Eventually, they just go on the Ferris wheel. So at one point, Daniel pretends to jump out of the Ferris wheel car to touch the moon. He's a teenager or whatever. Well, this triggers Claudia to have a flashback about Allison's death last year at camp. So the book's been really building up to this point. We're curious what actually happened in camp. And this is the first of a series of flashbacks where we get to see what might have happened. And in this flashback, Claudia remembers that one day the four girls were hanging out in their cabin while the counselors were away and they were playing a game, Truth or Dare. Allison actually sneaks over to their cabin. She's actually staying with the younger girls in some other cabin, but she just wants to hang out with them all the time with her older sister. I guess understandable. But they just want to get rid of her. So she's given a truth or dare choice. Truth, tell the girls how Allison stole Marla's boyfriend and made out with him. Or dare, cross Grizzly Gorge by log under the full moon at 10 p.m. after lights out. Allison is both uncoordinated and terrified of heights, so no one actually thought she'd go through with the dare. But she actually does accept the dare. 10 p.m. that night, under the light of the full moon or whatever, they all, five of them, sneak into the woods. Except that Marla gets caught by the counselor. The rest of the girls, however, make it to the gorge and are trying to convince Allison that, you know, it's a really bad idea. You're really bad at heights and balancing, so you probably wouldn't even be able to do this log in broad daylight, much less at night. Two-thirds of the way out, she starts panicking. The counselors are coming, they hear the voices, they see the flashlights, and all the girls just start panicking. So they all run back into the cabin so they're looking caught, and they think that Allison is right behind them, so they all just kind of like scatter into the woods. It turns out that she wasn't right behind them, and she actually falls to her death, but nobody sees this. She's having this horrible flashback, snaps out of it, realizes that Daniel has not actually fallen off of the Ferris wheel. She's kind of just been spaced out sitting there. When they get off the Ferris wheel, she sees her friends and she's like, hey, let me introduce you to my friends. Yeah, and he just disappears. Ooh, ghost boy. She's the only one that could see him, apparently. So that night, the girls are woken up in the middle of night by Joy's screams. She's covered in leeches. And it's reminiscent of the previous year at camp when she was covered in leeches after going for a swim in the lake. Joy's fear of bugs has her checking the bed before getting in, and there was no leeches in it at that time. And there's definitely no leeches in the ocean, so someone must have brought leeches from somewhere and then put them on her while she was asleep, which is mad creepy. Marla runs out to talk to Alfred about this, and Joy just tells the other girls that this is all Marla. She must have invited them over to torture them because of what happened to Allison. And the other girls are like, well, that's kind of a weird thing to say, but we'll keep our eyes open in case any other weird things happen. So the next day, they all go water skiing. Sophie's the first person to ski. Now, Now, the previous year, she wasn't a water person, but ever since she found out some astrological thing, she's decided that, no, she is a water person, and she's become a better swimmer in the past year. Was she like a Pisces or something? I think so, yes. Oh my goodness. Sophie's doing actually a really good job skiing, and she's doing tricks and stuff. Look, mom, no hands. Well, Claudia's next to go, so she's getting ready to go next. All of a sudden, Joy just starts screaming. Sophie's gone. 
And all of a sudden she sees that Sophie is out there in the water, flailing, caught on a riptide, calling for help or whatever, and like not connected to the boat in any way. Marla can't get the boat over to Sophie. The engine has stalled. Right, so she's like turning the key in the ignition. She's like, see guys, it's not working. Oh my God, I don't know what to do. So Claudia decides that she's somehow got great lifeguard training, even though she doesn't. Don't do what she's about to do. She jumps in the water. She's got no personal flotation device. She's got no extra flotation device to give to Sophie when she gets to her. She's got nothing. Regardless of that, she tries to swim over to Sophie. And she gets pulled into the riptide. Surprise! And just as she thinks she's about to drown, she gets pulled out of the water by Carl and Dean. They've actually showed up in the nick of time and have rescued both Claudia and Sophie. Dean and Carl take Sophie and Claudia back to the Drexel's dock, where they're reunited with Joy and Marla. Claudia examines the nylon rope toe and finds that it's been cut. It's got smooth ends, and so it's not like it frayed gradually over time and broke or anything like that. It must have been deliberate. Wild accusations fly around. Marla and her dad had just taken the boat out last week so maybe it was the ghost boy Daniel or maybe it was Caro and Dean and I mean it was obviously too convenient for them to just rescue them so maybe they cut it and then when the chance came they're there for the rescue. Joy confesses that she actually told the boys to come so it wasn't a coincidence that they were there. One other thing is maybe when you're going water skiing just check the rope toe before you get in the water. It only takes a minute Joy, Sophie, and Claudia meet up once again to discuss the fact that Marla is trying to kill them, so they think. Is it because Marla's blaming them for Allison's death? She must know it was an accident. And then we get the full reveal. We get another retelling of Allison's death scene. They weren't so much telling Allison to stop as much as they were egging her on. Just do it. Just finish it up and we can all go back to bed. So after they peer pressure Allison onto the log and she gets a good of the way on, she looks down and freaks out. She can't do it anymore. She's starting to freak out. She's starting to kind of topple over and she falls down onto the log and she's kind of just holding onto it with all fours. She's begging them to help her. She's like, can one of you please come on and help me? Just please. And they're just like, stop messing around and just do it. Yeah, hurry up. So Allison is actually screaming, help me. But the girls just leave her behind. As soon as they hear the counselors coming. They never find Allison's body, just a blood-soaked t-shirt. They must feel pretty guilty about this because at least Claudia has been kind of blocking out this true memory in her mind because even when she has that flashback, she remembers it differently. Now that it's all come out, these three girls decide it is definitely time to go. They need to leave or Marla is going to kill them. Claudia calls her mom to pick them up, but turns out Claudia's mom can't come until the day after tomorrow, so they're just gonna lay low and be careful. They had to kind of just make it through one more day, and at first the next day seems to be more calm. Joy and Sophie play tennis by themselves, and then later Joy goes to town with Carl, and Sophie goes to take a nap. Marla has chores to do, so she's kind of staying away from the other girls. Claudia decides, you know what, I'm gonna get in shape and go for a run on the beach. She thinks that in the distance, she sees Marla. And as she's running, the atmosphere around her just gets really eerie. There's no bird sounds. There's no birds. It's like, you know, when there's a predator around, the entire forest gets quiet. Well, it's like this on the beach. Soon she realizes what the reason for that is. There's actually a big old Irish wolfhound behind her, and he's chasing after her. Irish wolfhounds are bred for speed and aggressiveness. They make perfect guard dogs for a reason. So it's running faster than she can run, and she needs to get away. So she dives into the water in an attempt to escape, but the dog actually goes in the water after her, swims also faster than her, and latches onto her ankle. She manages to kick the dog off and starts calling for help, but there's no one there. She kicks and she swims further out, swimming and kicking and screaming, and the dog is just right at her heels, nipping at her. Lucky for her, she swims right into a shark. She keeps calm and manages to get herself into a riptide current that carries her away from the shark, but the dog is a little bit less lucky. And it gets eaten by the shark, and the ocean is full of blood and chunks of dog. I think it actually doesn't get bitten in half, pretty much. I think she's She sees half a dog just floating by. She says she sees dog meat. Oof. The tide throws Claudia onto the beach as she passes out. Claudia wakes up with Marla standing over her. Marla ends up helping Claudia back to the house. Claudia is relatively certain that that dog was the Drexel family guard dog and that Marla set it on her. So while Marla goes up to get first aid supplies, Claudia goes to the dog pen to find that the gate is open and the dog is missing. 
that's pretty much it. This has got to be the final proof. So Claudia rushes into the house, tells Sophie to back up. They can't leave yet, though, because Joy is still in town with Carl. Marla arranges for them to all meet in the gazebo at 6 for dinner. And they're like, well, it's raining outside. There's this horrible storm building up. And she's like, no, 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 it's inside. And it's when Joy comes back, just we'll all meet there. When Joy gets back, Claudia tells her everything that happened with the dog on the beach and tells Joy it's time to pack. The plan is to demand that Marla take them to the train station. It's three against one, so it should probably work. Like I said, that big storm is going on. There's strong wind. There's lightning strikes all around them. And the lights are flickering by the time the girls head to the gazebo. So on the way to the gazebo, they're hit by an awful smell near a small white shed at the edge of the lawn. It's a heavy sour smell like decaying meat or rotting eggs. So, of course, Claudia goes to investigate and opens the door. And as soon as she opens the door, Marla's dead, decaying body falls out. Marla's skin was purple. Her eyes had sunk deep into her skull. Her jaws were frozen open in a permanent scream of terror. Yeah, so that's pretty messed up. They panic and run to the house to call the police, but the line is dead. Of course it is. It wouldn't be a free street book without the line going dead. They try to leave, but not only is the gate closed, remember, they have an electric security system. That thing is electrified. So they're trapped. They have to go around back to go to the control pad that's there to turn off the system and then go out from the back, go around the fence to get to the main road. Halfway there, they get stopped by an angry, quote-unquote, Marla holding a pistol. It's not Marla. It's Allison. She didn't die last year. Dun-dun-dun. This is her crazed scheme. She's on a killing spree because the girls abandoned her instead of helping her on that log. She murdered Marla because Marla's smiling face was the last face she saw when falling down the gorge. Marla didn't care about her. Her parents never cared about her. So when she was pulled out of the river by a nice and caring family, she pretended to have amnesia so she could stay with them. Yeah, okay, but... The hatred and anger built up over the air, and she knew she had to go back and kill everyone. She knew her parents would be out of town because they're always out of town. And then while she was hiding in the pantry, she heard Marla tell Alfred that the girls were going to be invited. So she killed Marla and took Marla's place. And since Alfred was so nearsighted, it's not like he could tell the difference. Yeah, that's... Okay, so now it's time to kill all the girls. And she starts by pointing the pistol at Claudia. The lightning strikes are now literally around them. As one of the lightning strikes hit, they see a figure walk out of the guest house. It's the ghost boy. All the girls are freaking out. Allison keeps asking him who he is and shakes her pistol at him, but he calmly walks over to her and tackles her to the ground. If only a weapon like a pistol could be used long distance. (laughs) As Allison and Daniel are tied up with each other, Claudia grabs Allison's pistol, and then another lightning strike knocks out the electricity. Allison manages to get away and runs towards the gate. All the girls tell her to stop because of the security system. No, Allison, no, Claudia screams, staring after her. It's electrified, Joy screamed. Stop, the gate is electrified. The power is off, idiot, Allison screamed back. All three girls are running now, running after Allison. Too late. Claudia heard a generator hum on, just as Allison grabbed for the gate. She heard the crackle, saw Allison's arm catch in the wired mesh, saw Allison struggle to free herself as a white streak of electricity encircled her body. Allison screamed once, then her body jerked and tossed inside the bright white electrical flame that appeared to dance around her. And Allison is dead. For real this time. Daniel reveals that he's actually Alfred's son, living in the guest house while on break from school. Obviously, he couldn't tell them because the Drexels are not nice people, and they wouldn't be happy if they found out. Sophie and Joy think that they're gonna try calling the police again, that maybe the phone line is back on. And Daniel and Claudia kiss while standing over Allison's dead body. The end. Uh, okay. That was something. Alright, callbacks. This is actually not the first time that guests being hunted for their lives in a beachside mansion are trying to escape during a thunderstorm. This actually happened in Party Summer. That's basically the only callback, right? Yeah. 90s things. 
Renting a videotape. They rented Bye Bye Birdie and made fun of how regressive it was. Mm -hmm. The phone line is dead. That's probably one of the scariest things that could happen in the 90s, apparently. I guess it has to be, right? Because that qualifies it to make it into almost every single Fear Street book. And in some books, it's probably the scariest element because the rest of it isn't that scary. Here's a good one. Not keeping in touch after summer camp because they couldn't find time to write. So nowadays, that doesn't really happen because they're going to have each other's social media info. They're going to be like Snapchatting and Instagramming and all that stuff. They'll kind of keep up with each other. That whole like losing touch after summer camp doesn't really happen anymore, I don't think. And now a word from our sponsors at Shady Side Sun Removal Cream. So Anna, have you ever gotten a sunburn and wished you had remembered to apply sun lotion? Yes, and the aloe just doesn't help. Well, you can say goodbye to the aloe. Because with Shadyside Sunburn Removal, the burn is guaranteed to go away. Just one application and your skin is brand new. Wow, where can I get this? It's as easy as calling your corporation representative. Reach them at 740-229-9618. What's that number again? Why, it's 740-229-9618. Representatives are standing by. Side effects may include but are not limited to excessive hair growth, possible Sasquatch mutations, and homicidal ideations. Do not use if pregnant or expecting prolonged exposure to sunlight. Do not call your doctor if experiencing any side effects. The corporation is here for you. Wow, I bet Claudia wishes she had that stuff. That would have really come in handy. Nitpicks. This one, I think both Anna and I were a little bit perturbed by this one. Allison and Marla are never described as being identical twins. One's definitely older than the other one, and yet somehow they managed to fool all of these people. Or, I guess Allison manages to fool all these people when she kills the actual Marla. She's able to take her place pretty convincingly. Yeah, that's a bit weird. Yeah, maybe another 90s thing, right? If they'd all kept up with her Snapchat, they would have known. But there's hints about this throughout the book. I guess it's, in retrospect, you can see it. Yeah, for instance, Allison was described as not being very athletic, and she was horrible at tennis. Mm -hmm. But there are a lot of signs, if you know, in hindsight. But just the idea that three girls would not recognize that that's Allison, not Marla. Marla. Right, and Alfred, how short-term has he been with this family? Like, they're described as being, like, not nice people, so maybe they just go through butlers, like, once a year or something? They're like the Gilmores. <laughs> a butler a week. If this guy had been with the family for any number of years, he would have been able to tell, nearsighted or not, you can tell. It's really weird. And since that is the big reveal, and how everything was able to happen, it's just, you're rolling your eyes. I guess if you're going to believe it, then it boils down to the Drexels are such shitty people that they don't have a reliable butler taking care of their daughter. And they did such a shit job raising both of their daughters that they're kind of homicidal. Another sign that maybe their butler doesn't really care much about his job. Did he not smell a rotting corpse? Yeah, he's clearly not really cleaning anything up. Why did only Claudia call for the ride back home? If they were that sure that Marla was killing them, why didn't Joy and Sophie call? Like, Joy was the first one on board this we need to leave thing, and she didn't think of calling her mom. Right. And then if they were that desperate to go, they all took the train there, and Joy literally went to town with Carl. Why didn't they all just go to town and then take the train? Yeah, that seems like the simplest solution. Just take the train. Okay, they didn't do that. I'm not sure why either. What is the point of Dean saying that his dad used to work for the Drexels? Are they that reviled and hated? Did he just punch Marla just because I hate the Drexels? I think it was some sort of red herring, but it never really yeah, built up. Exactly. I think you're right. I think it was a very ham-fisted red herring and nobody fell for it. Okay, another nitpick. In what universe do people find a teenager with amnesia and then keep the person like someone would keep like a stray animal? Right. I was actually going to put this in 90s things. Actually, like 750 BC things, because this is is like the story of Romulus and Remus where they get raised by a wolf and then taken in by some people. It's like, that doesn't really happen. And you would think teenage girl body not found would be in the newspaper and in the news and the police department would know and as soon as this family found a girl from the river or whatever, they would go to the police and say, hey, we found this girl. Right, and then later, I guess she ran away from them or did she like kill them or something? What's the deal there? I mean, there's a lot to nitpick in this book. 
not super consistent with itself, but I think we're just going to get into that in our thoughts on the book. Fear Street Mythos. Summerhaven is described as being a four and a half hour train ride from Shadyside. So we're thinking probably Shadyside number two. The one in the northeast, because this beach area does have a very northeast feel to it. Yeah, this place actually really reminds me of Long Island. Just the name Summerhaven is a very Long Island town name. Is it? It is, yes. We have a lot of towns with some word and then ending with Haven as the suffix. The big sand dune on the beach and the long straight beach with the riptide across it is very reminiscent of Long Island beaches, actually. Further out east, there are mansions right along the beach, much like this one. And there is a train that goes all the way up the island, all the way along all the beaches. So it kind of matches up. I just got that vibe from it. The corporation did a very good job of covering its tracks here, so we can't really tie anything back to them. (laughs) Right? I guess we could get really creative with this one, but we would just really be grasping at straws. I think it's really interesting that here we are in the second episode of season two, and it seems like so far the books are kind of just these one-off fear of the week books. Kind of interesting. Hopefully we'll get back into the meat of things pretty soon. So what did you think of the book? So I'll give you that. It surprised me at the end. I think I had no idea what was going on until the final flashback where they said they couldn't find the body and all they found was a bloody shirt. And then I was like, aha, (laughs) she must not be dead. That was like all the way at the very, very end of the book. I had no clue what the heck was going on. They were suspecting Marla for all the wrong reasons, but I also knew it couldn't have been the the ghost boy because, okay, that's a weird red herring. And Dean and Carl were really, you mentioned, ham-fisted red herrings. So I'll give it that. I I was surprised. I felt like it had to be Marla. There was just no other way. And you just couldn't figure out why it was Marla. Right. You know, like, and the reasons, like you said, that they were giving just didn't make sense. Oh, she doesn't want to talk about her dead younger sister. She must be trying to kill us. It's like, well, I think the fact that she was the one dishing out the salad or the fact that she kept going to Alfred over these things. Yeah, exactly. And just the motive wasn't there. And then the little switch at the end with the Allison thing made sense. Do you think Allison hallucinated seeing Marla's grinning face? Or do you think Marla was actually there, like, hiding out in the woods? I don't know. It's kind of up for debate. I don't know if it's actually worth debating, but it's debatable. I'm not sure. She might have already been going kind of crazy. She certainly went completely nuts after she fell off that log. That's a little understandable, right? Mm, I think falling off the log should be a euphemism for becoming a homicidal maniac. She did go all the way there, didn't she? Mm -hmm. It's a little bit much, I think. I could believe that Marla managed to find a way away from the counselors and watched her sister die. And there was obviously no love between the two of them. Yeah, how messed up would Marla have to be to just stand there and grin while her sister's dying? That's pretty messed up. Their parents did not raise them right. That's all I gotta say. I remember I laughed out loud when Allison died because it's, oh, she's alive. Oh, she's dead. And I was like, that was the most anticlimactic thing I've read so far in a Fear Street book, I think. (laughs) When Dan and Claudia are talking at the end, he's like, oh, have I convinced you I'm not a ghost boy? And then they start making out. She's like, well, you have now. They literally have not moved from standing over Allison's dead body. What? Pretty messed up. These girls are kind of, I mean, first of all, you get Sophie, who just does everything Joy does. She clearly doesn't have much of a personality. And then you get Joy just wants to flirt and doesn't give a shit. And then you get Claudia, who's like not even willing to come to terms with her own role in Allison's death and would rather just forget about it. I don't know if this is a nitpick or a thought, but when Joy and Sophie run off to call the police after Allison has died, for real this time, the phone line was out. Why would they think it was reconnected in the 10 minutes that this whole thing took? (laughs) The phone line was out before the electricity went out, so just because the generator went on doesn't mean the phone is going to be on. Yeah, I have no idea. Maybe they're going to use smoke signals or semaphores or Morse code with a uh, searchlight or something. I don't know. Wouldn't it be wise of them to have checked the front to see if there's a panel there to turn off the electric gate? Because think about it, that would mean that every time people wanted to leave the house, they would have to go to the back, to the control panel, and then go to the front. So there has to be a control panel in the front. You know what would have been really hilarious, though? If the generator didn't kick in and Allison got away, they would have all been tried for murder, and the drug souls would probably have really good lawyers, and they'd be in jail forever. No, because they could do time of death with Marla's body. And since she was stuffed in a woodshed, decomposition would match a timeline. She probably got killed like the day before they got there. And it's been seven days already. 
seven days locked in a wooden shed in the middle of the summer versus eight days locked in a wooden shed in the middle of the summer? I think it was more than a week because it made it seem like she had killed Marla after she had heard the interaction between Marla and Alfred. And that was a week before the girls had got there. Okay, well, 14 versus 15 makes it even harder to place time of death. Oh, 14 versus 7. Yes. I gotcha. No, okay, yeah, 14 versus 7. Yep, they could probably do. The question is, is the Summer Haven PD up to the task? Also, you have to think about it. They could do the time of death thing. Like, let's say they have a really good CSI department, but that costs money, and the detective has to make that call. Like, do we need to really dig into this or not? No, that's autopsy. Mm. That's by the medical examiner. Okay, gotcha. Two points here, I guess, I want to make. First of all, if the girls told the police that Allison was back from the dead and trying to kill them, and she was the one that killed Marla, I think the police would be immediately suspicious of that. They would be inclined to not really believe the girls. A. And then B, in regards to the medical examiner, I feel like they're not gonna... Well, you know, it's the Drexels. Maybe they would go all out. I'm not really sure. You're right. Well, I... medical examiners are going to do an autopsy for a murder case. Right. That is a yeah, thing. absolutely. Unless there was no suspicions of anything else. Like, if they thought it was like a natural cause thing, they would be like, oh, no autopsy. But if they think it's a homicide, they would do an autopsy. They're, they definitely think it's a homicide, obviously. Yeah. yeah. And also, they wouldn't blame the girls. They would probably blame Dan and Alfred more than anything else. Right. I would say the girls would be off scot-free, but Dan and Alfred would have a lot of issues. And I think even with Marla's first death and Allison's actual death, Alfred and Daniel are still going to be questioned. How did you not know the difference between (laughs) two girls who aren't identical twins? Yeah, it would have been pretty messed up. So anyway, I think it's best for everybody that Allison died at the end. It was kind of hilarious the way she just ran off like, no. It was so bizarre. I don't know how I felt about this book, to be honest. I think when I was reading it, I was like, well, it's obviously Marla. I wonder why she's doing this. And she's like doing such a good job acting like Mm -hmm. she's surprised, but she's obviously doing it. And I don't know why. Is she actually trying to seek revenge on what happened to her sister? So then when the reveal came, I think the reason that I had an issue with it is because they're not twins. This is the most ridiculous. It's like, you know, in Mission Impossible, they just tear off masks. (laughs) Yeah. But the thing is, they don't change anything out with their bodies. So someone who's 5'8 would pretend to be someone who's six feet tall and just wear a mask but no one tells the difference obviously there's a few inches missing in height but you don't notice or in build and it's like the most absurd thing ever is just ridiculous i think yeah no it is silly how many ghost boys out of five would you give this book i think i gave it one and a half rounds to two okay at the end it kept me engaged until the end even when i was laughing at how ridiculous it was i was still engaged in it but it just wasn't the greatest it was a okay one offer. I guess I would give it like half a ghost boy or maybe like half an Irish wolfhound floating in the Atlantic. It really was not that great. There was like a moment there where they were watching that movie and they were laughing about how sexist it was or whatever and how they're so much more progressive now. Is that just Arl Stein patting himself on the back because he has a quote unquote exotic looking character? I don't even. Whatever. This book didn't do it for me. Not a good way to get into the Fear Street series for sure. Yeah, that was not the most memorable book. Definitely if you want to read a trapped in a mansion get out style Fear Street book, go read Party Summer instead. It's much better. I think our engines are stalling on talking about this book. So let's just make our predictions for the next book. All right. Yeah. What is the next one? Fear Street, the new boy. He was a hunk of trouble. On the cover, we have a girl and a boy. It seems like the guy is trying to peek inside this room. He's got the door open ajar, and the girl is just hiding on the other side of the door, side-eyeing him, just hiding from him. She's wearing a very 90s jean jacket, and he's wearing this turtleneck thing, and I don't know, she looks very skeptical, and he looks very curious. So I think it's a story about a new boy, and either he or the girl live on Fear Street. So I bet he's really good looking, and as the new boy, the girls are all like, oh, I want to date him. Maybe the dates just aren't going well. Maybe he's like the guy from First Date, a little bit trying to deal with his Norman Bates issues. Okay. So I would say it would be a male murderer, female victim. I would say the cause of death is strangulation. All right. So I also have a prediction for this one. I think that this is going to be like the mirror image of the new girl. The famous first episode of the Fear Street series. I'm just going to like basically gender flip all the things that happen in that book and say that's what's going to happen. So basically this boy moves into Fear Street, but I think he's got a dark past. I think he actually murdered his sibling before he moved there. He's actually a little bit crazy. 
the girl in this book actually falls for him, but she also has a boyfriend or like, not like a boyfriend, but like a guy that she's interested in, like a love interest, like a boy next door, boy next door, right? Maybe they're childhood friends or something. And she's trying to decide between the new boy and the one who really understands her, so to speak, to quote a Taylor Swift lyric. Trouble ensues. It's going to be like mirroring. It's going to be rhyming like poetry with that first book. The murder weapon is going to be, I'm going to say, let's say gun. It's going to be a gun and murder. Murder is going to be male, and murder victim will be male. All right, locked and loaded? Locked and loaded. Thanks for listening, guys. Yeah, see you next time. Bye. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Red Read Podcast. Join us again as we continue our journey down Fear Street. We love hearing from you guys, so feel free to reach out to us at Red Read Podcast on Twitter and Facebook. Email us at red.read.podcast at gmail.com. Don't forget to like, rate, and subscribe. Once again, thanks for listening. See you again soon.